Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? Very well. You're doing you? well. Yes. Merry Christmas in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thank you yeah. for your time. Um, we are grateful that you gave an opportunity to have this conversation with you. Yeah. We've heard of Dr. Prince Pambo, what you do for sportsmen and women, but we, many of us barely have an idea about the kind of person Dr. Prince Pambo is, uh, how he started and how he got here. All right. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to um dig into my life if i should put it so like you rightly said what everybody knows is the products we put out there but yeah. what created a product so um dr prince pambo did not start at, as dr prince pambo probably started as kofi uh, which is the name i'll be called at home mm -hmm. um i am the last of um eight children okay. so um, my mom and dad had nine of us and I happen to be the last. So if I am an Akan, then they would say Nkroma. But I come from the northern part of the country, 100% northerner, from the Bolly Bamboy constituency. Oh, okay. So that puts me in the new Savannah region. Oh, okay. Now, born in Sunyani, uh, so I grew up a bit in Sunyani then. Continued education, um, the typical Saito education uh, in, in my village up north. And um, so I lost two the name siblings. Of the name Jama. Jama, okay. J A M A, yeah. not German. So uh, it's around the Bui Dam enclave, oh, okay. Okay. you know, so okay. we are caught in between Gonja land, the Banda, that okay. side of okay. town, okay. a very kind of hybrid um, ethnic group called Mo. Yes, so I have six sisters. I, I, I lost one brother and oh, um, okay. a sister. Oh. So that's uh, who I am. Started my basic education from the village, like I said, and then moved on to Tamale, where I had my secondary education. I didn't attend secondary school, actually. I attended a minor seminary. Okay. Uh, all boys uh, were being trained to become Roman fathers, so I attended St. Charles Minor Seminary. Okay, so okay. there are quite a number of people around, I'm sure, who would identify with St. Charles. Yeah. A very small school. But uh, very, very famous, actually. Yes. Um, I think my class, um, almost all the science students in my class, apart from those who went and became Roman fathers, the rest are doctors oh, I see. and engineers. Oh, okay. So, yes, I'm in quite a good school. So I moved from the minor seminary. Unfortunately, I didn't make it to the uh, major seminary to become a Roman father because my dad had only one son, which is me. Oh, okay. So, and he was a king. So, if if I became a Roman father, that the meant, lineage is gone. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure I regret not being a Roman father. I am happy where I am. So I moved from there to KNUST. Our time, the K and then N were not there. It yeah. was UST, yeah. uh, where I did my degree in the human biology and then progressed to do the MBCHB, which okay. is um, the medical school. So I attended, um, had my basic medical training um, with K and UST. Completed, did a um, fellowship there. Life was leading me towards uh, trauma emergency. You know, that was how I was looking at it. I mean, sports medicine wasn't part of the consideration. So, um, but of course, even pre-university, family wanted me to do pharmacy. I wanted to do medicine. Family wanted me to attend Legon. I wanted to attend KNUST. <laughs> so it was a whole uh, mix up, you know, but then I uh, pulled through medical school then along the line an interest in sports medicine just popped up just like that and i got an opportunity uh, to get a national scholarship to go train because we don't train sports physicians in ghana my time so i then had my sports medicine training with the university of nottingham uk okay. and then um so really that set me uh on this journey because okay. there i met um, great people who were medical officers for FIFA and then I, oh, okay. I came back to this country somewhere 2011 
and then I came with a FIFA project called the FIFA 11 for Health. So we use football to train children in schools and also to pass on health messages because we, we FIFA identified the, the, the power of football and then they realized that if you attached a message to a football technique, yeah. kids never forgot it. So we used that tool and we ran a very good project here in quite a number of schools. So basically, yes, this has been my journey so far. Married some um, 20, almost 20 years ago oh, wow. to one wife. <laughs> And, uh, you have to emphasize that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a northerner yeah. and uh, people believe we are capable or we are allowed to have more than Especially one. Especially also being a prince. Being a prince. Yes. My own dad, who is late now, though he was a king, he had one wife. Oh, okay. So I don't even have step siblings. So all nine with one woman. So I couldn't... Uh, do it differently. So maybe an assurance to my wife that uh, it will forever be one wife yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and no, She's no, the no side issues <laughs> and uh, blessed with three lovely daughters oh, okay. at the moment. So yes, this has been my life journey. And uh, as a prince uh, growing up, um, what kind of treatment did you get? Uh, so, so I think my prince was a proper, proper prince, to be honest. Um, I grew up in a village, but really not hardship. You know, normally when people describe, oh, so I had uh, yeah, attended Saito, yeah. attended a, a, a school, a village in the north, then the only thing that comes to yes. mind is that, okay, so I walked barefooted yeah. at some point, I had a torn uh, pants and all that. I think when people want to raise fans, they throw in these <laughs> cards, you know. But I, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, my my village upbringing, I'm, I'm sure, uh, was better than Accra upbringing. Yeah. I mean, the son of the king, so with sisters all over the place. So really, um, I, I didn't get to 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 suffer. Yeah. And, and it was it was quite. I mean, I grew up in a palace, so. Um, I didn't have to lift a thing, and unfortunately, that's that's making me struggle because I can't cook. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but my sisters will do everything, everything for, you. for you, including washing your your things. Your stuff. So I think the positive aspect of that is it 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 put me at that level that I needed to work hard yeah. to make sure that I can afford that comfortable life that I know. Yeah. You know, so, okay, now your sisters are not there to wash your things. What do you do? You don't marry somebody's daughter and ask her to wash your things. Yeah. They should be able to buy a washing machine early life. Yeah. You, should, you know, those basic yeah. things. So, yeah, that, that has been it, really. Yeah. Okay. That, I, that, I, yeah, that upbringing was, was a good one. Yeah. I, I get it, but is that how the name Prince came about or you had a different name? Or? No, no, so um, like I said, last born, when my dad gave birth to me, he was a king, so. You were just named Prince? Yes, this is a prince. Okay. Yeah, so it's a title, it's a name. It's a title and it's it is a, a name, a name yeah. as well. You spoke about sports medicine and that's the area that many of us know you. Yes. And um, you also spoke about how you came back in 2011 and you spoke about the project that you mm. came back to. Yeah. With. How yeah. would you describe mm. that project? It, it, it was um, very successful. I mean, it was one of the flagship programs under Seb Blatter and uh, Professor Ye Jivorak, who okay. was leading um, football medicine as at the time with fever. Okay. And of course, when Blatter had to go, and then um, quite a number of his top officials had to also bow out just because of loyalty you know but we run that program here uh from 2012 i think all the way to to 2016 and we've been to every region in this country we trained a lot of teachers and then we use those teachers to train um these school children and um up to date i mean if you met some of those teachers and the children who went through it they still remember the messages we're teaching them things like respect um the girl child respect your classmate wash your hands before eating and then we threw in things around protection and all that and we link them to 
uh, football skills like heading, dribbling, defense. I remember the heading and all that. Exactly, yeah. you know. So it 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 was quite okay, and of course, to to it was a, a, a kind of a corporate social responsibility thing, fully sponsored by FIFA, using the FA. So we use uh, PE teachers who were also kind of football inclined, okay. and we use some of the GFA development coaches. So we actually worked hand in hand with the technical. Uh, department, department of, of the, the FA, FA. Okay. yes, you which know. was headed by Oti Akenten. Oti Akenten. Yeah. Yes, okay. so that was quite um, a good one. And of course, I mean, one of the educational bit I left, I was uh, um, somewhere 2015 16. Then I developed an interest in the area of sports cardiology, yeah. um, issues to do with sudden cardiac yeah. death. I mean, how come black African players were dropping dead more than our Caucasian brothers and all that? So I did a proposal again. I got full scholarship from Ghana Education Trust Fund and FIFA and GFA to do a PhD in sport cardiology. Okay. So this was a collaboration between myself and my colleagues in Germany, uh, Zabrocken. So my supervisors were the um, Professor Tim Meyer and uh, Jürgen Schahag. Tim Meyer was the senior doctor for the senior side, uh, German male national team. Okay. Shahag was for the under 21. As at the time, I was the team doctor for Ghana under 20. Exactly. Well, so we, we, we did that collaboration where we, we did ECGs and echoes of the hearts of um, our football players here. And we compared it to the hearts of um, the Caucasian players uh, in the West. And we, we saw great differences. So it's, it's one of my, my huge interests at the moment, uh, which has put me in one of the new FIFA uh, consensus groups at the moment involved in uh, developing a consensus uh, paper to guide the, the, the screening of adolescent football players okay. when it comes to the uh, uh, pre-season training or uh, pre-season screening or pre-competition screening um, exactly what we should pick and the kind of questions we should ask currently we are involved in in that project and I happen to be uh, one of two doctors from Africa I think we are globally anything around 10 12 doctors Wow. working on this project and this of interest. You mentioned the under 20, the under 20 bit, uh, yeah. when, you had, when you went to do the PhD in the... In Germany, basketball. yeah, sports cardiology. Yeah. Yeah. Sports cardiology. Mm. You're already working with the uh, Ghana Football Association yeah. as a team doctor for yeah. under 20. Yeah. At what point did you start working with the, senior, uh, with the, with the, with the national teams of the FA? So I, I, I think I started working with national teams from 2012. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. When, when, so I came in 2011 and was involved in these uh, FIFA projects and it was um, um, GFA collaboration and all that. So that, uh, I think, sold me uh, to the FA. And um, in, in 2012, you know, GFA would do their normal reshuffle. Yeah. So I was a new uh, entry and then uh, the then president and his executive committee told I was quite young I mean really uh, but it gave the opportunity to start with under 20 and um, I think it was a very vibrant team as I mean the under 20 had gone to conquer the world yeah, in 2009 yes. and then uh, Bobo was still the, t uh, the, 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 the coach yeah. in 2012 and our first assignment was was nice. Africa, we we, we won the silver. Yeah. We played finals with Egypt and went to the world and we won bronze I in in twenty thirteen in, in Turkey. Turkey. Yeah. Uh, twenty fifteen we were in New Zealand. I think we didn't impress so much, but it was it was a good time. That was the tournament, uh, Mali. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I think we were very complacent uh, as a team. Maybe. I mean, I'm not a technical person, yeah. but they were just too good for us. So, uh, but oftentimes, now I'll come back to the the medical aspect. But oftentimes, when you're on the bench and Ghana is losing, how do you feel? Uh, I I I don't know how to describe the the feeling, but for we the medics, it's when the game is ongoing, you can't feel anything than to look out for injuries. 
Okay. So, so your mind is, okay, why is this player not working the way we want him to work? Why is he not able to run well? So you are thinking into the next game. You are thinking into what you will do after the game. So, so you look it, at for performance. Exactly. You, that, that's what you do. So really, I mean, I've been on a bench and players score goals and I don't get to know who scored the goal. Because at the time, maybe the goal is happening. I'm actually looking at another player. All right. Or a player goes and one, two. Okay, you go there. So will you go in, see and come out. But you are still thinking. Because mostly, I mean, ninety percent of players will tell you we can play, but you come by. Like, can you really go? You know, and the coaches will be looking at you. It, it's it's funny because when they are playing and the coaches feel this guy should have this kind of speed, it's not going. Then the coaches will turn and look at you a bit. You know, so they say, okay, does the guy have an injury that I didn't pick? You know what I mean? What's happened? Did he did he eat too much? You know, so those dynamics are there. So. The typical fans are worried with the goals. Okay, we are losing. We get to mourn the losses after the match. You know, so there are, I've heard comments. Sometimes you just enter the dressing room and say, ah, so we've lost the game? You know what I mean? That's when it dawns <laughs> on you. Yeah, and then and you also get to know that, okay, you have a lot of work to do uh, in the medical room yeah. post games. I mean, sometimes you work till 4 a.m., just to make sure that people people are fair. especially if it's a tournament situation, all right. Because at the end of the game, some players are injured. Now you are thinking of the scans you have to do. Uh, which players are going to be ruled out? Um, are you able to fix players within 48, 72 hours for the coach to use them? You know, so those are normally your preoccupation. The outcomes, of course, yes, you 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 are interested because, of course. Um, there is my, my material benefit to that as well. Yes, so yeah, I we feel the same thing any normal Ghanaian will but, feel. But, but. but how challenging is it? You just mentioned something the player is not putting up a certain speed, and the coach will turn and look at you. Mm. <laughs> you are taking responsibility for the performance of the, yeah, the that, player on the pitch. That, that's what you signed for, you know. I mean, so the, 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 the coach knows, and most good coaches would discuss maybe their lineup with you not that I mean before but yeah. then once they bring the players up or you would have to they would just let them know i mean a day or two before they would let they would ask okay is everybody fit so for instance what we do currently every morning you would have a medical meeting uh, with the coaches so the coaching staff and the medical staff every morning sometimes 7 a.m you normally will have a medical meeting where you have to brief them on all the medical happenings so if you trained this evening tonight we'll work all night through in the medical room and tomorrow morning we have to tell the coach okay so after training yesterday we saw these players everybody is fine and today 4 or 5 p.m they are all available to train all three players cannot train so we will do a bit of work on the sidelines you know so you have those discussions so if it's a, a monday minus one minus two then the coaches will want to know is every player available for me to pick my 11 and myself from then say yes all right so you have signed that everybody's okay and the coach knows that okay these guys here on the wings are supposed to be speedsters why are they not running well okay did they have an injury that you are not aware you, you understand what i mean so once they finish you go direct and ask is it possible that a player can have an injury we, and we know players. Players, yeah, player yeah. will be injured and tell the doctor, I can play, I can yeah, play. Yeah. But is it possible for a player to have an injury and hide it away from... So, so at, 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 the, at the very top level, they don't do that. You know, they, they, they know what, what's at stake, you know. I mean, you know your performance as a player. And you know if you hide an injury, the performance will expose you like we hear. I mean, if the economy, yeah, whatever, yeah, the yeah. fundament. Yeah. If we know this is what you can do. So if you hide the injury, we'll see it. So at the top level, they don't, they don't do that. They will let you know, this is what I have, but then I can do this. You know, so you would have to have that frank discussion with, with the player and the coach. And say, okay, so this player is 70% fit. So it's up to the coach to decide. That player A, 70% of player A is better than 100% of player B. So this is what I choose to do. Okay, or the, 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 the role I'm going to get him to play. 
ideally if it was 100 percent this is what i'll get him to do but now he's 70 this is what i'll do okay so i haven't come across a situation where a player is hiding an injury from me i think what plays out is that if the players kind of have confidence in you and know that if i tell dr pambo that i have an atf or sprain all right he'll fix it then they'll tell you unless of course they feel that if i tell this doctor this or this therapist this he can't even help okay but then if you know i mean this gentleman can give me a hundred thousand dollars i mean why would you hide your poverty so really that is what plays out well, that's quite an interesting one because yeah. sometimes we are watching the game and we're wondering ah he's not even chasing the ball yeah <laughs> I mean, these are human beings and um, things happen and, and the body, there's an extent to which we can all understand. So sometimes maybe as a first, or some player will just tell you, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm probably not clicking. You, you can't say much. And there's always the psychological part of everything as well. And this journey has brought you to the national team, the Black Stars. How would you describe that journey so far? So my sports medicine journey or football medicine journey um, has been an interesting one. Uh, so, so for me, it, it started on three levels, all right. So it started with the fever level. So people typically will go from the base up, okay, but then I came from the top where okay. I came in with a FIFA project. So I was already recognized as a doctor working with the Federation, which is the governing body, yes. you know, then I got into uh, my association here. The my association, BGFA, presented me to the Confederation African Football. All right, so um, I, I've been involved at, at these three levels. Okay, so for some major tournaments uh, on, on the continent, like the Afcons, like the Chans, like the maybe U17s and all that, then I have to go and work for the Confederation of African Football as a, a venue medical officer and then a, 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 a team a doping control, a doping control officer as well. So there, um, if you were in a venue, let's say Abidjan or Yamusokro, then all the four teams at that venue, the, the, the stadium there, it's your own. You have to make sure emergency medical services, everything is in place. Uh, the hospitals around, the entire medical setup, everything is fixed. And then you take charge of doping controls as well. So I've done all that. So at some point, I'm a team doctor sitting on the other side of the table. At another point, I'm the supervising doctor conducting the test. So it's, it's been an interesting one. It's been rewarding. It's been challenging has seen positively challenging um, because you need to do a lot of work to stay very um, significant and relevant in, in, in your industry. What would you say has been the major challenge since you got to the senior national team level? Okay, I'll even go to under 20. So I, I had one uh, interesting challenge in under 20 where a player who was supposed to be um, a very good player, I mean, playing for, I think those times, Chelsea, under 20, good defender, I mean, checking all the right boxes. And then he was caught, you know, and um, I remember the first time he had to join camp, under 20 camp, this guy actually trained with the Black Stars because the Black Stars were also training. I know him. You know, then, and, 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 and there were quite some huge names following him you know and we're all very excited that uh this person was coming to play uh, for us you know and i remember after that training this i was at this the, was part of the 2015 under 20 yes yeah. i i kind of also watched him a bit so right after the training he came over and i saw that his knee was swollen you know so the coaches will give their technical input, oh yeah, he's this, uh, so, but this guy has a knee problem, you know, and it will be difficult to communicate this because this was supposed to be the pillar for, for us. When we're traveling out of country, I said, okay, he should sit by me in the plane, you know, I needed to have conversations, you know, he was quite tall, you know, He's and, purple, I know him. yes, then 
it was still difficult for him. We went, we played a few friendly matches, you know. So I called him and I said, you know what, I, I need to get your medical uh, documentation from your club for us to discuss X, Y. You know, those times, I mean, names were already submitted. Yeah. Final list, you know. I got a information from the club and this guy had done a couple of surgeries on the knee. You know, so my decision as a doctor was that, yes, um, it, it's, it's going to be dangerous to have him as part of the team because um, he was going to take the slot where a very powerful player could occupy, but because he had a big name, yeah. you know, so I said, okay, I mean, from my medical point, this guy cannot. Then, okay, my big people come, okay, we've submitted the name already. So I went into FIFA books. I said, okay, there's a medical reason you can change a player. So I shot out an email to FIFA and said, okay, we want to change a player. All right. And um, you need to support with um, medical documentation. Now I got a medical document from, from the players club. I needed the player's consent to send out these documents. But then you are sending it out to, to take him out of squad. How are you going to manage it? You know, but I still spoke to the player. I say, you know what? Uh, we're trying to do something to protect you. So I'm sending this information to FIFA so that we'll all monitor you and see how best we can help. And he said, yes. So then the next day, um, we were successful to change him. Then it became a media war. I mean, um, the guy is playing well and Dr. Pambo decided to change him. In you fact, know. they even said um, bribery and what, what. Exactly. <laughs> and this is a case, the guy himself would say, I'm not injured. Because as at the time... He actually went and tweeted that he was not injured. Exactly, you know. But then, that, that's a difficulty because as a doctor, you are not permitted to also slap media platforms with the player's medical information you had. So I had to tell him that, but I have all this information, why are you saying this? You know, so for me, that was quite a moment, you know, but then I, I stuck to it knowing I was doing something right. Fast forward to national team, I think a build up to the World Cup, uh, there were players you would expect to be able to come along and all that. Then injuries started happening yeah, yeah. to players. Injury. So that for me, it's always a very difficult one, you know, to, to communicate to your coach that not you player a can do but unfortunately player a cannot play you know those decisions and sometimes you have to weigh the options okay so should i uh, can he be part of the team for me to try and see if he would um, get better and play you know and those are the risks i don't take as a doctor in the sense that um i feel if you've given me a list of 40 players then you are telling me they can all play. So if one is injured, I will not risk it. I will say, look, he's injured. I can't guarantee you uh, that if I took him for a tournament or a game, I'll turn things around. What if it doesn't happen? Then it's you, the doctor, who took an who took injured. Who responsibility. Yes. So because I remember we've had similar experiences where players were taken to a tournament. They couldn't kick a single ball. I remember, was there Anthony Annan? There was yeah. yeah, exactly. They went to the 2013 AFCON yeah. because yeah. they were hopeful that along exactly. the line they would be fit to play. That's right. And, and it always happens when these players are at their peak. You know, so what helps me is because I have interest when it comes to the technical aspect of football. Really, I mean, I think everybody's watching all the games now, Champions League, EPL, that I, if you came to my home, I mean, where, you know, around this time, they may have the remotes, yeah, yeah. you know, no, no, if you came to my home now, they, I mean, you watch all the oppressed, all my TV is actually on either CNN or, uh, I don't want to mention your station so that you feel good. <laughs> You know, but joy news or something, to be honest. I'm not very crazy about football. And it helps me because then you get to know a lot about the players. You know, this is what they can do. Purely medical. We're proud, we're proud, if I should speak three. But then if the player is injured, he's injured. Wow. And I've seen people come in, slot in, take opportunities, and they make big names for themselves. If you remember a player called Atama. 
Yeah. 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 We went for a tournament where a player got injured. We had to replace and Atama traveled. Atama was part of the team and was dropped. And then this opportunity came, he came and that's it. That's how Atama got his international exposures. So, yeah. You are more of the medical person. You don't care what happened to the technical aspect of it. You don't want there to, to attach are, emotions. Exactly, that's the word. No emotions, no favorite players, nothing. Very indifferent about it. I'm very emotionally attached to my sick clients that I see in my day-to-day -day practice. Yeah. That for sure. But when it comes to the football aspect, no. Because it's an emotional game. If you, if, you, if you don't guard your heart and you get emotionally attached, then it will reflect in the work you do. You find yourself praying that ah, this player should not be injured, this one, but I've, it's 90 minutes on the pitch of play. Everybody can do it. What were the experiences in Qatar 2022 working with these players? So Qatar was, um, if I should use the word, very disciplined camp. Um, every player um, comported himself, did what technical people wanted them to do. Um, I'm sure you didn't hear of any controversies oh, yeah, yeah, in yeah, camp. Yeah. I mean, the medical and, aspect. And on the medical so. aspect, uh, at a point, I mean, Otto and his team were okay, how did you do it? Because we had a very clean sheet. Prior to every single game we played in Qatar, of course, we played just three games. Yeah. But prior to all three games, we had 100% sheet for him to pick his players from. But of course, that will also be appreciating the work of my, my other members, yeah. Dr. Corte, the lead physiotherapist, yeah. um, SK Ankama, Carlos, Benjamin. These were guys who came to help. And everybody worked, plus our uh, dietitian, Rene, and, um, yeah. and uh, those who did a physical training, um, uh, uh, Romeo and all the guys, you know. So, and of course, the coaching staff. When you have coaching staff who understand the scientific aspect of the game it makes it very easy for you so when you tell coaches that you know what this player this player cannot train today they will understand you this player can train today they will understand you let's give this player the biggest exposure match day minus two okay but match day minus one let him sit out all right they will give him the next exposure at the games itself so when you have that collaboration, perfect. And I, I thought Qatar was a good one. Now let's come back to the Confederation of African level. Um, mm. You mentioned something quite interesting in the early phase of the conversation, where mm. you said that statistically, many African players yeah. often have this sadic cardiac, sadic, uh, sudden cardiac arrest. Yeah. Why so? Right. So um, the study I did. And then, of course, from what other people had done area in, in my uh, literature search confirmed that. So what I found from my study was the fact that they had, our black African players had exaggerated response to physical activity. Now, every sportsman or woman. When you say exaggerated exactly, response so to physical activity, what so, so every sportsman or woman or any individual, once you are involved in physical activity, sports, running, anything, the heart puts on a bit of muscle. So just as if I go to the gym and work my muscles, they become bulky. If you are involved in sporting activities, the, the rate at which the heart will contract and relax to pump blood to the rest of the body, it does it more, all right? Then the left side of the heart, called the left ventricle, gets thicker, and then plus other physiological changes when, when that happens. So the study we did confirmed that when two players, one, let's say a British, and then a Ghanaian or Nigerian, they are exposed to the same level of training and everything, the heart of the Ghanaian or the Nigerian will be bigger compared to that of the British or the German. We saw this clearly. So we call that exaggerated physiological response to physical activity. Now this is the catch. When that happens, 
there, there's a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is one of the key conditions that will predispose players to suffering cardiac arrest. Now, when our players develop these big hearts, it makes it look like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because that is how the disease condition also makes the heart look like. Oh, okay. Now then we... So is it our genetic makeup? It's, so it's a genetic predisposition. That's the key word. So it, it puts our players in a zone where we call... You, you, there's a diagnostic challenge. There's a diagnostic dilemma. So if I did pre-competition medical assessment and I saw uh, that kind of heart, I'm quick to say that, oh, okay, because it's probably a black African player, that's it. Yeah. So the motivation to dig slightly deeper to see whether this is a disease condition becomes very tricky. All right. And then the only time you might have some obvious manifestations yeah. of it will probably be an arrest. But like I said, the bottom line is a genetic predisposition causing this. And just recently, two weeks ago, I was in South Africa for um, a calf. Do <laughs>